You're listening to the Regeneration Rising podcast, a podcast from the Kavira Coalition about the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of agrarians in the United States. Each episode will explore what it means to work in regenerative agriculture, how people came to choose this as their livelihood, and why it's important to them and the future. We hope to build a foundation for a strong community of future agrarians and land stewards with a regenerative approach to community, relationships, and the land. Welcome back to another episode of Regeneration Rising. I'm Taylor Molia. And at the top, I just want to announce here, we are actually hiring at Kigera for a couple intern positions for a short period of time. So we actually have two positions open, a communications intern and a podcast intern. So if you're interested in learning more about how podcasting works or getting into the world of communications sort of in the environmental realm, um, please contact us. You can find more information about that at kiveracoalition.org. And in the About tab, hit Work With Us. Okay, on to the show. I'm very excited for this conversation. My guest is Emily Brown. She is a farmer, a rancher, and a public health advocate. She helps run her family operations, Elliott Farms and Mariposa Ranch in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. Emily and I first met, I think, at a Regenerate conference, or it could have been a Rocky Mountain Farmers Union convention, but immediately I noticed how down to earth and experienced and eloquent she was, and I'm so excited to have her as a guest. Emily and I talk about coming back to a family operation and what that might look like, going through succession planning, which is a totally complicated topic that I really didn't have much experience with. And then we also talk about women finding their identity in agriculture and how she has used Rocky Mountain Farmers Union and Annie's project to kind of help advocate and find her role within agriculture. So thank you so much to Emily for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy our interview. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. We're really excited to have you. Yeah, I'm excited to be on. Let's get started. I I think your story is so fascinating. I have lived in Colorado for a handful of years, but I, it's really rare to meet people whose family have come from the state. And your family has been farming in the San Luis Valley for a hundred years. So tell us about growing up on a generational farm. You can tell us about the property and then what it was like growing up. Sure. I live in the San Luis Valley, kind of in farm country between Del Norte and Monta Vista and center area down here. And my husband and I are currently working with my parents on our farm and kind of in the process of transitioning it to take over. And so we grow fresh market russet potatoes, and then we do a rotation crop and um, traditionally have done a malting barley crop with coors. And now we're starting, uh, my husband and I bought some cow-calf beef cattle, oh, maybe around six or so years ago. And so we're incorporating the cattle into the farm. And so we grow sometimes a rotation crop of a cover crop to feed to the cows, or um, we actually have cows on the farm on one of the fields this winter feeding them. So kind of fun to see where that's going. The farm has, it's a centennial farm, which is a, a, you know, a designation in Colorado for a farm that's been in the same family farmed for over a hundred years. And my grandmother's family um, was the one that kind of first started um, putting together the farm. And then her husband, my grandfather, was kind of the one that consolidated the farm from that family into a little more of the structure, what it looks like today. And so then my dad farmed with him and now we're um, farming with my dad. And it's fun to see the cows on because I think it was a joke that my dad kind of says that he wasn't necessarily planning on farming. And then when the farm got pivot irrigation, so it used to be flood irrigated, and now most of the farms in this area are kind of half mile square circle of a big sprinkler that goes around. So he that was a easier process. But then they also used to have a lot of sheep. There was a lot of sheep in this area. And so for multiple reasons, there's not now as many, but my grandpa got rid of sheep and my dad thought, okay, he can handle the potatoes, but didn't want the animals. And now we're coming full circle and bringing the animals back on. 
yeah, it was, it was a great place to grow up. You know, I uh, it's kind of just the lifestyle of being around the farm. You know, you go out and in in the harvest time and go out and see where the potatoes are coming in and pick out the funny like heart shaped potatoes or the weird silly ones that you get to decorate or being able to go around with my dad and turn on sprinklers or play in the water and run through it. We were always around it. I didn't, I wasn't super involved as a kid, um, but I was always really proud of that piece. You know, I went to college and it was fun to like take the really weird potatoes or take the giant zucchini from uh, my mom's garden. We always had a garden. I really like to garden and preserve, but so I enjoyed being able to show off like, oh, here's this rural element that maybe other people weren't exposed to. The school that I went to, which is actually where my kids go to school and where my dad and my grandma both went to school, it's pretty much just this consolidated rural school that's in the corner of a couple a couple potato fields. <laughs> so just out out in the fields. And so you're right next to there's actually the the school, the high school track always had this weird divot in one section of it because part of the sprinkler wheel from the field cut through the track. Oh so you had to sort of plan your timing of when you were out practicing because uh, you didn't want to get in, in the sprinkler rotation. Helped help keep the field a little greener though. But our our mascot was actually the the farmers. So we had a you know this mascot that had the cowboy hat and the pitchfork. <laughs> that was actually our logo. So it was kind of just part of part of all the growing up that it was just, you know, kind of infused into infused into my background, I guess. Yeah, it seems like too, it, it, you've probably seen that valley change so much. Like it's, I, I'm, I'm sure there's still a lot of the same aspects to growing up there and growing, like your kids are going to have a pretty similar, hopefully a, a similar experience running around in irrigation ditches and climbing up on things and pulling potatoes out of the ground. But I'm sure you've seen the valley change a lot too. Yeah, I think it is kind of a mix. You you hear people from the valley say that sometimes that it's like I remember this when I was a kid and my mom would talk about the movie theater and that the movie was always like, you know, it was always several months after it was released everywhere yeah. else that it would finally come to the valley. So it was one of those things that everything was a little slower and for sure like – you know, we we now get movies that are released the same time they are everywhere else and with the internet and um people's ability to work remotely we have a lot a lot of people that have come into the area because they just see the beauty and they like the the culture in the area and are able to still make a living at their jobs because they can work remotely mm -hmm. so um there's definitely change there and especially the last couple of years just with the covid pandemic and some of the changes you see you see a change of who's coming into the area but then at the same time that's also like the idea that that the valley is always at this sort of midline that we never get the really high highs we're never getting the booms of big money or um, big changes but then we're never seeing the super lows that when there's you know big issues or big busts you know like the housing markets or um, even some things around COVID, it doesn't hit the valley quite as hard. It's sort of like, is this main line? So in some ways, it's kind of the same as it's always been. <laughs> so it's interesting, just the different, um, you know, the ways you look that you can see big changes, or you can see things that look the same as they have for hundreds of years. Wow, that's so interesting. It's so I feel like it's um, getting rarer and rarer in Colorado to find places like that. And it's just so much development and so much change elsewhere. And so I I think what another interesting fact about you is that you you didn't really think you were going to be farming. So you went from high school and college you went to get a master's in public health and you studied in Boulder and and you met Kyler, your husband. What what about public health stood out to you? Like why why is that a direction that you went, do you think? Yeah, that's you know, I definitely it was not on my radar as a thing. I didn't know what public health yeah. was. Um, I don't think any like teenager is like, I'm passionate about public health. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, maybe now after COVID, maybe, but yeah. maybe more people yeah. know, but no, I think it's, it's um such a broad field. I actually, so I went to um, CU Boulder for my undergraduate and got a bachelor's in communications. And one of the classes I took in my very last semester of college was this health communications class. And I just found it really fascinating talking about some of the ways that you know, how doctors communicate to patients or how we, um, you know, lay out health materials, how much difference it makes on, on how people interpret that information or how they can be healthier. And so it was something that, you know, I had just you know, made me think a little differently. And 
my husband and I moved out to Reno, Nevada a couple years after college. And I ended up working at the University of Nevada, Reno. And one of the benefits, I was classified staff at the university. And one of the benefits of being staff was that you got a couple credits um, paid for for free as kind of a staff benefit. And so I said, well, I feel like I should be using this. This is a great benefit. What should I do with it? And I was looking through the different options for master's degree programs. And the only one that sounded remotely interesting to me was public health. And so I kind of just fell into it. But as I got into it more and more, I realized what a great fit it was for me. And I'm just, I think, you know, public health can be so many things. I have a really good friend that I met in the program that um, does like restaurant inspection and does that regulation environmental health piece. And then I have another really good friend who's um, really into fitness and also has a couple degrees in in gerontology and um, aging health and knew someone that wanted to be a physical therapist and another person that wanted to crunch the data. And so public health can fit. this. It's more like this mentality that fits into whatever field you're looking at. And it's really this idea of being able to look at the big system so instead of looking, you know, public health versus individual health is that idea of you're you're trying to create health policies or changes that impact a broad group of people versus just an individual person. And then that public health system, you know, instead of just looking at how how does this one program impact or how can we impact, you know, how can we implement some change individually or at a small level? It's more like how can we set something up that's at this broad level that then has this huge impact at a very early stage of health. So, you know, vaccinations or not allowing smoking inside or um, all these different things that, that you can do. And I've just really liked that perspective of not only looking at the big picture, but also looking at how you actually make a big impact in the community. There's so many like little issues. And when you get into you know, <laughs> your health or the community or whatever it is, it it can be hard to think about how you can solve some of these or how you can make it better. But when you're looking at that public health perspective and you're saying, okay, like it may take a while or you might not be able to see this change on an individual level, but you can actually have some big impact and actually make some changes. So mm. um, I, I did a focus, like my focus was never anything of like a specific field. It was more the broader idea of public health in a rural setting. So even though we were living, you know, outside Reno and I didn't have plans necessarily to move back and farm at the time, I always knew that I had this connection to rural areas or that that was an important, important community and, you know, lifestyle for me. So um, I figured out how to fit my public health. Yeah training into that. Yeah. I can see too a lot of overlap in terms of looking at the bigger picture. Like now that you and we'll go into this later, but working at Rocky Mountain Farmers Union and trying to see the bigger picture of things and how you can sort of tweak things there to make things easier for people down the line. I can sort of see how that public health transition to who you are today. Like it clicks for me just knowing you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Looking at and I think farming too, like you could you need to see the bigger picture. Like you need to understand the long term, like is this going to be a problem? There are so many things that can go wrong in farming, but let's zoom out and and understand the entire system. Um I think that's really cool. And I think that your story is is relevant for a lot of people because you went off and sort of found a lot of interests and and your partner outside of the family farm and outside of that community that you grew up in and then you came back so after working in Reno and getting your masters you came back to the family farm and you worked in in the public health field in your home community um happened to be during covid <laughs> which is insane that you had to be handling all of that, which is a whole nother story for another day. But I'm curious about how, what was it like moving home? Like you had, you had a husband and kids at that point. Like how, how was that for you? We did all these life transitions all at one time. So when I think about like, how old is my son or how long have we been back in the area or how long was I at my job? They're all the same thing. <laughs> um, so it just happened. I think it was like a connection of the HR director at the county who knew my mom, who knew I was in public health, who then passed along the um, application. So it was this, you know, small town connections. But I interviewed 
for the public health director position in our, our county when I was almost, you know, I was like eight, eight months pregnant with my son. And so, um, accepted the job, but told him like I needed to start a few months later because I needed to move across several states and still kind of on maternity leave and needed to get settled. You know, I was familiar with the living in the San Luis Valley. And so that wasn't as much of a change as just everything else. Like it was becoming a mom and trying to figure out how to then be a, a mom. We moved when my son was a month old. So pretty much as soon as I lived in the Valley and as soon as I was in public health, at the local level here, I was learning all these roles together. So yeah. we joke that there's a, a local restaurant in our in the town near where we live that just was a great has great food and a great little community. And that was sort of our saving grace that we would take our son in his little carrier and stick him under the bar and just be like, oh, we're not sure we're parents or <laughs> we're not sure, you know, we don't have access to as many restaurants or cultural things right, now. And, right. and this was sort of like our place that we, we connected in the town and the community because um, we were able to find a lot of other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Being in Reno, like where, yeah, it seems like if you're in a college town, you're like, and then coming back to San Luis Valley, which is yeah, just much different. You get your thrills yeah. elsewhere, not necessarily yeah. in the city. <laughs> well, and you know, it's it's a huge, huge deal to live close to grandparents. My mom was able to watch both of our kids when they were really little, which was just huge because childcare, especially for kids under a year old or even under three three years old is really hard to come by Mm -hmm. here. And so that was a huge thing because I was working full time and my husband was working full time on the farm. And so it was, you know, that just became an integrated part of what we needed to make that work. But we were lucky. I had friends or people that we knew from college or high school that lived here, but then jumped in and made a lot of friends in the community and just were lucky to find, find a place that we really fit here. So It definitely, (laughs) like there's definitely pieces of that transition that were more difficult, but um, for the most part, it just, it kind of felt like, like coming home. And in terms of like actually coming back to farming, like we didn't mention, but Kyler has more of a background in ranching than farming, but coming back, how was that transition for both of you in terms of the farming business? Like coming back to integrate into the business were your parents surprised that you came back and wanted to actually farm? Were there any successes and challenges there kind of reincorporating? I think that um, is still an ongoing process for <laughs> sure. Yeah, it was kind of interesting and it'd be you know, a good story for Kyler to tell as well at some point that when you know came back to be close to grandparents with my son and then I had this job, but then it was kind of this thing that my dad was trying to think about retiring, but he had also had a hired man for several years who was no longer able to work. And so he was sort of in this position of trying to figure out how to have that extra help on the farm. And so Kyler started working for my dad. And I think he talks about it sometimes that he sort of felt like it was an opportunity, like maybe it's just a good timing that he would be sort of an outsider perspective that could help move this conversation of transition along. And I think it moved a lot slower than we thought originally, but now that we're a few years in, it makes sense. Like there's just so much accumulated knowledge, you know, with farming or anything seasonal with ag, like there's things that you do just one time of year. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through several years where you're like, oh yeah, now I, I remember this thing or I know how to do this or I have this accumulated knowledge. And so it takes a lot of time to transition. And it's also our farm because of how my dad and grandpa had managed things is it's in a pretty stable place, but it's still one of those that if you started to make major shifts or if you, you had someone come in that tried to do something different, not realizing, you know, the climate or the land or the costs, you could not be farming really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was something, you know, my dad's been really cautious of trying to make sure the farm continues. And so I think that you know, I've the last couple of years have been able to be more involved. I, my dad is actually, he has been doing the books for the farm ever since his mom wasn't able to do them anymore. And that's one of those things that hadn't gotten transitioned or, you know, he was still just doing that. And him and Kyler were learning the like on the ground farming part together. And, or he was teaching, I guess, teaching Kyler those things. And um, so I was able to come in and 
he he felt comfortable transferring that over to me or it just happened to be the right time or however it worked out. And so that's a pretty big step because you have to you have to know all those pieces and be able to, um, you know, know the finances in order to make those those on the ground decisions. So it's just been a it's been a process. And I think that, uh, you know, like you mentioned that Kyler has a background in ranching. He's he's very, very good at reading animals and reading horses. He says that's he he likes to be. Uh, up on top of a horse, not under a tractor, getting hydraulic <laughs> oil all over yeah. him. Um, but also, he can he can read a person or read an animal and make decisions and make changes. And the mechanics of a tractor, you can't talk to it and then expect it to give you feedback. So, us getting cows, I think, has been one of those balances that kind of we've been able to fit it into the bigger you know how we do ag for our family. But it was definitely one of those things that was almost like a a mental health right. outlet that right. gave something else that was um, our own and something we could do, but also we get to ride horses around to check the cows and it's lovely and just a different, you know, hobby slash work slash living. And you guys too have tried to incorporate some soil health initiatives, I guess, on the farm because, you know, you, like you said, your dad kind of had things down, but so it's hard to kind of, and it, gosh, you have to have so much respect for somebody like your dad that has has made it work. Like a lot of the farms ha- have gone under far before today. I mean, there's, you kind of look around and the only ones left, you have to have a lot of respect for them because to have made it a hundred years in, in a family, on the same piece of land is an enormous accomplishment. So there's like this respect that you have, but this also this desire to optimize it and use new ideas and kind of start transitioning some things into maybe a little more a biological approach. And so can you talk about some of those management practices that you've kind of tried here and there on the farm? Sure. Some of these, like the soil health practices, it's kind of the trend right now. Like people are recognizing the value of some of these practices that previously happened and really trying to bring them back and incorporate them again. And then for our region, they're is constant concern about the water in the area and the aquifer and some of the, you know, over appropriation of wells and water, but then also just how climate change impacting. So there's an, I think additional focus in, in our area, just purely from a water use standpoint. So I think partially Kyler and then um, I was, have started to get more and more involved in some of the regenerative ag or soil health practices because it's something that we connect with and um, has a lot of values that that we think highly of. So just taking care of the land and working with the land. It's an interesting dynamic with potato farming. You know, one of the big, big practices of soil health is to, you know, just plant into the ground that leaves standing stubble and then plant right into that. And you can't really do that with potatoes. Like the whole part of planting potatoes is you dig up the ground to put a potato in and then you dig up the ground to take the potato out. Constantly ripping up the ground. (laughs) It's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what Kyler says. It like hurts his his soul sometimes, (laughs) but so, but there, there are things that you can still do. And so like the idea of spacing out your rotations or putting, you know, using a a rotation crop that maybe is putting more nutrients back in, or, you know, we're trying to look at a cover crop that is nutritious to our cows, but also has, brings in nitrogen or brings in beneficial use to the land. So as we're switching, so the next year for the potatoes, they'll have those nutrients and the ground will be healthier. So we'll, we're, we're continuing to work on that. It was really fun. Last year we had a a local company not too far away that does this fungal compost and a fungal tea extract. And we've worked with him for a couple of years and we're able to put some of the extract through our sprinklers on, it's like half a field of potatoes and half a field of our cover crop. And so we also had some late rains, so maybe that impacted, but we really think that that made a difference. We just had this gorgeous cover crop. Like there was like peas and and like these beautiful blooms and ladybugs all over. And so it was, it was really fun to, to see some of that. And so we'll see, um, we have our cows on that field and are feeding that hay right back onto the same field. So we'll see how that, you know, how that ground looks this year for potatoes. And it is hard to change. Like a lot of, a lot of what previously happened on the farm was done because these other things didn't work or other changes happened and it went really poorly. And so it's been this very streamlined operation. And so it's good to learn, like, here's some new things we can try, but also be like, oh yeah, like, 
this is we time this all out because these are the resources or timing we have and so i guess that's part of the science of farming is that you're always testing things and trying new things and figuring out how to do it the best you can right and like having the humility cuz you know you learn about these this stuff in a book and then it's this grand experiment to actually go out and to incorporate it into a productive and profitable operation did you have my first question is <clears throat> are you working with any of with that group to monitor how if the soil's actually holding more water and is it so cuz i know i would imagine that in order to in order to make changes like that, you kind of need to know that it's working. Like, you know, you kind of know that it's working because you got there and you're like, this is beautiful and I've got peas and bugs and it's just like verdant everywhere. But also you kind of need the data to show, well, too, for your father too. Like it, it might be helpful to have the actual data. So do, do you guys do monitoring and, and sort of track that progress? You know, that's another thing with public health is that, you know, like to have a lot of data to look like, look at. And so it's always, yeah, we're always looking at trying to find other ways to find data and you could always want more. But we work with an agriculture consulting company every year that helps us kind of determine what fertilizers or inputs to put on and when to, when to water. And so they do some different soil tests to look at the nutrients in your soil. So I'm looking forward to seeing if, you know, we see any changes with that or if we're able to be improving soil. We actually have a, a little test project that we're going to be trying out this next year that we got some some water monitors. And so we're trying to figure out how to, you know, how to have those in the soil in a way that we can check out some of that soil mo- moisture and see if that makes a difference. Very cool. Um, and I think it's really valuable that you mentioned that profitability thing because it's um, it is that balance of trying to say, you know, what of these are we feeling like we're improving the land that we're working on, and which of these are actually going to be worth like are, are they going to make us profitable? Are we going to be able to keep farming this next year? Because you know some of these hopefully are lowering the cost. Like if we have better soil, we have to put less fertilizer on and those inputs are extremely expensive right now. So that's great if we can reduce any of those. But also you have to balance that if you are trying not to put as much in your soil and then you get a product, you get a potato that's just doesn't, you know, it's not as big or it's Mm -hmm. cracked or something like that, then you can't sell it and then you can't make any money because that's not what the market is wanting to see. So, and, and it's hard since it's just a once a year thing that you do something wrong this year and don't get a crop you have to wait a whole nother year until you get get to try it out again. That's yeah, that's that is so much pressure. Are you guys starting incrementally? So I I would assume so, but what does that look like? How have you just decided like maybe let's try a half acre of this cover crop or how did how did that process go like yeah, definitely incrementally and almost exactly like you said it that it's one of those that we were saying okay, we're growing a circle is is you know, the pivot, it's the about 120 acres or about a half mile square. Like that's a, the whole area of the valley. It's one of those that's laid out really gridded because of the sprinklers. And it was always, it's easy to go run or <laughs> exercise because you know exactly where half miles are <laughs> to measure. But um, so it'd be like one of those that say like, okay, normally we grow two circles of barley, but I think this year we could probably grow one and a half. That's how much we need to meet our our allotment with our contract. And so we'll try this other half circle with a cover crop and just see how that works. Cause we financially can, you know, if it is a failure, we can, we can absorb that right now. And, oh, it actually worked and it works for the cows. Okay. Now let's try, you know, can we, can we do it on a every year rotation? Um, I think that we're going to be getting into s- seen other changes and we'll see if they're, you know, they feel big in the moment. Like if we were to decide to grow a different type of potato variety, or if we grew some other, other rotation crop, or, you know, some of those are big changes for how the farm has operated regularly, but it still is a pretty incremental change in the, it's not like we're suddenly growing orchard trees or something (laughs) like that. And I think that's kind of just how our farm and the personalities involved in our farm have operated, that we're all pretty risk adverse. Mm -hmm. So no one is really willing to jump out and take some major change. But every year there's something different that's being tried. Oh, that's so cool. And it's cool that you have the cows too for the cover crop because you can just put them wherever. I don't know if even if you're having like weeds and you can kind of control them and use them as a tool on the farm. That's I'm sure I know it's a hobby and it's like a fun 
like side thing, like you mentioned, but it's actually a really amazing tool. Yeah, we've talked to a few people. We have a few friends that raise sheep and um, that used to be, you know, a bigger thing here. And that's come up a few times, like, have you considered sheep? And it's one of those that <laughs> it's so nice to have, you know, the sheep and cows target different plants and have different roles. And yet it's trying to balance like, can we actually handle like, you know, the the electric fence you have to put up for a sheep versus a cow is very yes. different if that's <laughs> how you're managing things. So, And not to mention like, yeah, I don't know, nutritional needs and different predator issues. Yeah. So much is, yeah, it's that valley is such a rich history with sheep grazing, but the type of grazing that they did was so nomadic. Like you had people out there with the sheep historically. And um, I know people still do that, but it is a different story if you're not willing to go to that level. Like you, then you got to start talking about electric fences and guard dogs and stuff like that. It's like, oh gosh, it seems like cattle is just a little easier in this, in this context. Well, and I think that that's, you know, for us, since since we have an interest in having the cows and um, it's something we like to do, it makes the work and the balance of trying to fit that in with the farm, it works for mm -hmm. us. We know we know friends who are farming that are having cattle graze, or we've grazed some friends cover crop, and it's a whole different balance because what you know someone growing potato or some other crop is looking to use you know whether it's having a cover crop to reduce water input but still have a, cr a crop on your soil to hold the mm -hmm. soil, or if it's trying to control some kind of pest or you know input issue, those kind of goals are different than we want to grow a crop that is big enough and healthy enough for a cow to like. And so it's always that balanced discussion. And we're, we're still working with friends and still, you know, part of that discussion because of how our operation works. We still need more than just what we have on the farm for our cows, but it's nice to be able to do it on our farm because you can balance that out. Like you said, like if you have a crop that's not working and you've lost the value of the crop, but are able to feed it to cows, which then they get value from it balances out in the end a little better. Right. It's kind of just diversity it, without too much diversity, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's like, if it works for you, if you really like the cows and it's kind of a, a soothing thing for you, then yeah, it's kind of a win-win. So yeah. So you guys, you mentioned that you're undergoing succession plans. You know, I, I thought it was really interesting. You said your dad felt like he just went through it. <laughs> like he just got done. Like he feels like, gosh, that was such a big deal from my generation before me to pass it down to me. And now I got to do it again. And so <laughs> how has that been for you, the succession? That has been a big discussion in our family over the last several years. I have two younger sisters and my dad had an older and younger sister. And, and so I, that's a big piece of, as you know, one generation is trying to think about how to lay things out for the next generation. And then also balance that idea of how to, you know, if you want the farm to keep continuing as a working farm, there's a lot of things you need to lay out so you don't lose the farm splitting it all up or paying taxes on it or something like that. And that was a hard process. Like my grandpa had done a lot of work to ensure that the farm continued. And yet still, it was a hard process for my dad and his family to, to make everything you know, to kind of settle everything out. And so my parents have actually been doing a lot of work to lay things out on their end. And there's been some hard conversations and it's just, a, it's a lot, it's a lot of discussion. And I've been really lucky that both my parents have been willing to have this conversation. And my mom especially has been kind of the driver of how do we make sure things are set up to you know, acknowledge that there's three daughters in the situation, but also to acknowledge that, you know, the equity and equality of of how things get passed on when you have a farm is going to be a different discussion because you can't just split up the land three ways and expect that it has the same value as if you have a full farm piece of land or business. And there's been, you know, a couple different discussions that my parents had started with. There's a extension agent over in Pueblo who's does a lot of focus on family farm transition and they had gone to a couple of his sessions but then we were able to have a connection make another connection of a different extension agent who came down and did kind of a facilitated talk with our family and really put a lot of effort into talking with individual members and making sure voices all felt heard um, and then was able to connect my parents to a woman who does 
ag estate planning, a lawyer that um, kind of focuses on this area. And she was, she's been brilliant to just be able to kind of understand farm, farm needs when it comes to transition and succession planning and help my parents kind of walk through some of that and help, help my sisters and I kind of think about that too. And that's what we're, my husband and I are kind of this year, we're, we're in the process with my my parents of trying to figure out the farm business piece and how we fit in there and how we, you know, I guess build equity or get connected into the farm business. And I think the hard part for me is when we initially started having some of these discussions that I had an example of like, this is how my dad went through it. And I have no other examples of how this worked. And you, like, I just wanted someone to say, here's, here's five different ways you can do it. You choose which one you want. And your accountant or your banker, or your lawyer, all is going to have a different thought about how things should be set up. And I just wanted someone to say, this is a good idea. Like, um, and they all said, you just tell us how you want oh. it. And then we'll, we'll, we'll help you figure out how to make that right. happen. And so just, you really need to, we need more resources. That's a huge discussion nationwide of how much ag land is going to be transitioning over the next, you know, 20 years or so. And just that that baby boomer generation and how some of that transition is going to be happening. There's going to be some big, big changes in, in the ag sphere. And if we want ag lands to continue, we need to continue to have more of those support staff people, those people that, you know, are the lawyers and the accountants that have this knowledge about how this is going to impact your finances or your, your will to be able to give advice and offer different scenarios to those families transferring land. Um, what are, what are ways we can do this better? <laughs> so, yeah. And it's, it's just like, it t- seems to me. So it, it's so much of an expectation to have, like, you're not only tending the land and like trying to do, be a part of an industry that is extremely hard, but then you're also like trying to transition this and also try to be an accountant and have your accountant brain and your lawyer brain. And you're like, just, you like, you know, none of us went to law school, like, you know, you don't have like the full perspective of that. So you're right, you go to one person, they give you they're like, well, depends on our perspective. And then you go to the accountant, and they're like, Oh, well, depends on what you want. And then you're just like, Oh, my God, I just need someone to tell me what to do. Because it's so much, it's so much to balance on top of actually being a producer, you know, and then being a a parent and like all the other stuff you've got to do, you know, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. My dad had made a comment several years ago about, you know, that this is, this is a hard process and you know, he gets stressed out working through it. And he said, you know, it could have been, I could have just made the decision to lease the land and it would have been so much easier. And I could have like instantly retired and I'm not sure what he would be doing. He, he, his life is a lot in the farm, <laughs> um, but it would have been much easier to just say, okay, neighboring farmers, you, you farm on my land. And um, instead of being like, I'm going to keep farming so I can train this next generation. And I, I think it's so valuable to, for kids from rural areas to have experiences outside of where they live. Um, for me, that was really like I, I needed to have those experiences of living elsewhere and meeting other people and learning other regions. But it's hard as well that we, because that wasn't the plan, you know, from early age that I needed to be, you know, back on the farm or training for that. And, you know, that we haven't been here. If we were here for the last 20 years, we could be way farther along in this process of transitioning the farm and learning all this this knowledge around the farm. And so it's that balance of, um, I guess, what each individual needs. But yeah, absolutely. And in our previous conversations, you were saying that like your dad never really expected any of the three girls to pick up the farm. And it was, it was like actually less of a gender thing, but it was more of just like a, you know, this is, this is really hard. And this is like kind of, I think also you mentioned like a safety piece. Like this is also kind of a dangerous world, especially with the farming side of it and heavy equipment. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Like how those complex family dynamics, like did he, is there a part of him that was like, I don't want you to financially struggle like I struggled? Yeah. I'll, I'll show him this podcast and then I'll ask him what his perspective <laughs> is. I keep thinking I should be asking yeah. that, but that's what I, I try to think about that, that 
I know, you know, I know growing up, there was a lot where he'd, you know, he'd tell us like, get out of the house, like stop reading, you come outside. And, you know, that was a place that at least for me that I felt comfortable, like inside doing projects or reading or, you know, the schoolwork and everything. And, um, liked being out and about on the farm but for whatever reason it just was not on my radar of really wanting to be learning how to repair equipment or getting into the details of helping on the farm and I think yeah I think that some of that was that that he my dad operates from a a really strong perspective of safety Um, he's the type of person that might tell you he loves you but also more likely will say like drive safe or here I'll I'll wash your car this is how I'm showing I'm taking care of making sure your windows are clean and there are a lot of a lot of things on a farm that are very risky and especially for kids that you can have an accident happen extremely quickly so I think there's a lot of things that were not he didn't have us involved because it was um it was a safety issue also I think now learning more about myself and seeing myself alongside my dad that um, I see myself operating a lot in the same way that sometimes like you just need to be away from other people to work through how something needs to get fixed or think through the work that's being done. And so I think it was kind of, you know, he went out and he did the farming and to bring someone else into that picture would just be more stressful to have those discussions. And then I do think, and I'll have to see if that's actually what he's thinking or not, but from at least some of what I've heard that, you know, he felt like his dad had been kind of hard on him or some of the stress of doing the farm work or being involved on the farm as a kid, that that was something he didn't didn't want to have to force on us as much. And so if we weren't like showing, you know, that wasn't our passion or we weren't jumping at it ourselves, he wasn't forcing that on us because he didn't want us to not like it. So yeah, I'll I'll ask him what his thoughts are on this afterwards. I think it's really cool to see that he is handing down a lot of this stuff and and being more open to sharing how he does things. I think that's I don't know. There's so many different stories in the succession conversation about that some people really having a hard time letting go of things and yeah, dealing with this scary. It's scary. It's scary to pass things on and think about what your life might look like with a little less farming, other people taking a little more of that, that, that work. Yeah. And I think then, you know, another piece, I realize more and more similarities between my dad and I, that if it was to have been a discussion, like when we were younger Mm -hmm. or um, before I was married or something that I don't think it would have worked. Like, I don't think my dad and I could have made this happen because we have too many similarities in how we (laughs) operate. But um, my mom is just really good at continuing to have these discussions around succession planning and bringing family in. And then really, I think in big part, just because of how uh, my husband's role in, in the farm that he's a good balance with my dad. And then he's a very good teacher. So he's able to you know, ask questions of my dad of why are we doing things or what are you doing or what's going on? And then he's able to in turn teach them to me and say, I'm interpreting this and now sharing this to you. And I feel extremely lucky to, you know, not everyone has like their own teacher to (laughs) teach them how to do the farm stuff. And so I've got both these people that are, that I'm able to learn from. And that's a pretty big deal for how my, how my transition into the farm is happening. Yeah, because you kind of have like a built-in, yeah, you have some built-in outside voices, like a built-in teacher. Then it sounds like your mom's like a built-in facilitator, kind of like that job of facilitating is so important. There's like, I really don't think people value facilitation, that work enough, just having that conversation and giving giving space to each person and understand and like pulling through the nitty gritty and all that kind of stuff. That sounds, it's very nice that you have that built into your family already. Yeah, we. Um, I had the opportunity just recently to complete an Annie's project in the San Luis Valley. And Annie's project is this program that's put on by Extension in Colorado. It's a nationwide program, but it's kind of traditionally done in a six-week program that's run, you know, three hours every day and brings in lots of different experts to learn about estate planning and commodities marketing and insurance for farms and human resource management. It's really like a risk ag risk management for women. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was a big deal. We've we've never had one in the San Luis Valley and had a group of people and 
that were able to get it going. And I was able to be a participant in the first one. But one of the things that you start out with very first is to do uh, real colors analysis. So basically that, you know, the, the test and trying to figure out what your personality colors are. And my mom is very much a blue. So she's very much the one that wants to make sure everyone's voices are heard yeah. and very much that facilitator piece. So um, it is, it is valuable to have that, to think about like, okay, how, do, how does family need to hear information and how am I communicating like that? I need to be communicating differently for these different people. Yes. Yes. So I'm like thinking about how women, are so critical in agriculture, like these things, these little things that aren't little, you know, that facilitation, that those conversations. It's actually, I mean, that's a huge part of the agricultural system that women oftentimes are carrying is like, let's have this conversation. Let's walk through these succession details. Let's have these difficult conversations. I don't know. I'm just like, go mom, <laughs> go mom and go you. <laughs> yeah. Just like, you know, having diving in and and learning and and taking up space and and understanding the whole situation and and getting in there i just really applaud you too for for doing that yeah i think you know that annie's project but some other opportunities for education and training i've been able to attend lately have been really valuable to me for this transition into farming and i was thinking kind of as i was first going into it that i was having a hard time learning stuff about ag and farming because it's just very different than public health. You're mm -hmm. in a private business and you're trying to make money and you have, you know, there's just so much of this science of growing and repairing and everything that it was just a very different venue than public health where everyone's very willing to share their ideas and their mistakes and learn from each other. Yeah. And, you know, that's a common stain of still shamelessly and give credit like everyone's happy to share everything and I was not finding it to be that way in the farm setting and have had to seek out different opportunities to get my own education but then I'm also thinking that some of it is also because ag is a very male dominated sphere still and how how I see that I learn and how I see that many women learn is on kind of a different, more social level. And there is a lot more willingness to admit how things are going wrong or try to, you know, empathize with other women and say, this is hard and tell me what you're doing. And, and so it's been fun to find different opportunities to talk to other women because I feel like we're able to make those connections in a different way. And I, I've also realized that I've had to check myself a little bit that you know, my transition back into this community, but also kind of establishing my career in public health happened at the same time that I became a mom. Mm -hmm. And I really built my identity as around my career as kind of a working mom. And for me and how I'm transitioning into the farm, it's really important for me to be actually, you know, on the tractor mm -hmm. or putting, pulling ditches or whatever it takes to like, I want to know how to do the work and I want to be involved in it. But I've realized that I've had to step back a little and say, there's so many, you know, I, I was saying to myself at one point, like, I just don't feel like I see enough women in this world of farming or where I'm at, or, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to connect with more women farmers. And then I have realized, like, I just need to, there's so much, so many different ways that women are involved in ag. And even though I'm a woman in ag trying to find this, I've realized, like, I need to, I need to realize that women you know, everyone's got a different way to contribute and that it doesn't have to be in the same way that I am seeing myself wanting to do that. So uh, good, good, constant learning, learning recognition process, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the bonding between women and agriculture, I think is so important. Like you see, you know, the women's ag conferences and women in ranching, stuff like that. You brought up a really good point about like, it does feel like there is a huge difference between, well, you know, every woman is different, but generally I feel like, um, yeah, the way that we learn might be quite different and jumping into agriculture. That's a huge difference is because you're learning generally from a lot of guys and we need to help each other laterally to help each other either share in that or start teaching each other in a way that's digestible for us, you know. Yeah, I've had to get better at realizing like you don't necessarily ask the question in front of everyone else, yeah. but you go have coffee with them right. afterwards and then they'll tell you everything. So just have to shift how I'm thinking about it a little. <laughs> right, right. And like 
I think that's so important. I, that Annie's project is really cool. I'm, I'll find information and put that in the description for folks. And one other thing I want to mention is your work, incredible work at Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. That's how I met you. So Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, you guys do a lot of advocacy for agriculture. And there are so many issues that you're working on right now. Are there some that you're particularly passionate about? Yeah, so Rocky Mountain Farmers Union is an ag advocacy organization for Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico, and it's part of the National Farmers Union nationwide. And that's what our our triangle of the organization is education, legislation, and cooperation. So we have a whole cooperative center that does a lot of training and support for different groups that want to form cooperations and learn about that. And we have some really strong education programs. I got into the organization through the Fellows Program, which is a year-long program where you get to meet other farmers and ranchers and you get to learn about the organization and you get to go fly into Washington, D.C. and meet with your legislators and just a really great education training leadership building program. And then they have some kid kid programs and scholarships and education. And then the legislation piece, I think, is something that is an area of the organization that I've been really called to. And ag is so varied and there's so many different ways that people are growing food and raising livestock. And Rocky Mountain Farmers Union is this big tent organization that really tries to bring in all these voices together, which is really hard sometimes because there's a lot of different perspectives and opinions, but it's this, they have this really amazing grassroots effort where you can bring an issue from the local level that's impacting your farm or your community. And then you raise it up to the state level and then even to the national level. And you have a way to, you know, have this united voice for making changes and in what impacts you. And I have been now on the board for Rocky for in my third year now, I guess, you know, one of the reasons that I got on the board was just that it was a way for me to have a voice and, and be able to use kind of my public health background and my, what I'm familiar with, with advocacy or education, and then bring it into a farm world. And it was a really good way for me to connect in, but then also just this idea of, of the secession or uh, transitions that I am one of the younger members on the board or was when I got on and just to continue to have that balance of men and women involved. And I just wanted to felt like I could represent groups of farmers that I was seeing in the organization and that wanted to make sure that, that those voices were being heard and that their opinions were, you know, getting incorporated into the bigger organization. And so it's, it's also valuable because I think it's so easy to get in your silos. And we've seen that, especially over the last few years that just, it's easy sometimes to withdraw and just do your own thing because it's hard to have discussions with people that don't agree with you. And it's hard to work on these big issues. And Mm -hmm. Rocky Mountain Farmers Union is one of those where you may not get along with everyone that's in the organization, but it's structured in a way that you still find there's still so much value in connecting with those people and having this exchange of ideas in a forum that still feels safe and still feels like family. And so you're able to make changes and have hard things, but then come back together. Right. Um, And so, yeah, that's been a great, a great group to be part of the last few years. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I've I've been to a couple of the events and the convention. And it is really amazing that you can be sitting next to somebody that you really do disagree with. Like you'll have a very fundamental, but at the end of the day, you have to find the bottom line of like the the through line, I guess, of like, where do we agree? And can we actually be productive and move forward so that we're both still farming? Like there are still issues that do need to get worked out and nitty gritty things that our disagreements do like, yeah. Sometimes they're not solved today, but I think it is cool too. Cause you'll see like, then you, we we're going to lunch and then you're sitting there eating next to this person and like enjoying them as a human, even though you do disagree with them. I just like today's climate, how, how often do you get to be a part of that? And there's sort of a standard of that. It feels like, I don't know if that was just me, but it was sort of the standard of like, you know, we have this talk about legislation and then we go to lunch and we just enjoy each other you know, and, and find ways we can, we can find similarities. Yeah. I think that finding opportunities to 
break bread together. That's that's so important. And I see that I get a little anxious to, I love hosting people, but to try to like find that food that's right. perfect or make sure your kitchen's <laughs> clean or whatever it is. But um, just to do that at your own house and be, I love being able to host people and have people, um, you know, have those conversations, those kitchen table talks. But then at that higher level where you have a, a group or an organization that, you know, recognizes that it's important to give people a stipend to come to participate in being a delegate or talking legislation and then also that they recognize that if you bring all these people and host them at a you know for a nice dinner where you only are there to eat and talk and have a drink with each other that just building those bonds in a social manner is so important so important absolutely because you can kind of start seeing too like over time I mean, I'm not sure if this happens, but I've seen it in my own experiences. Like over time, people start to really, those barriers start to kind of come down a little bit. Once you understand that that other person, like you're like, oh, okay, I totally understand where they're coming from now. I thought I did, but I didn't. And it just kind of takes time to understand who that person is, where they're coming from. So yeah, I I think the work that you guys are doing is is very important. And I'm noticing too, there's like a, there's an acknowledgement in RMFU that farming and ranching is a very broad term. A lot of people practice it differently. A lot of people, farming and ranching is changing. Like there are a lot of people coming into this space that weren't here, you know, or were not being heard or weren't able to show up at the table a handful of years ago. So are you finding that too? Like sort of coming to coming to terms with the fact that things are changing. People are showing up that we need to acknowledge. Yeah, I think that's huge. I mean, there's so many discussions going on around the nation right now about, um, you know, black farmers and indigenous lands and Mm -hmm. um, women in farming and younger generations having access to land and, and finding ways to really acknowledge these hard topics and discussions and then also balance them with these families that have been farming on the knife's edge for so long and have been trying to new new practices to keep things going and are trying to, you know, live in rural communities that are being gutted by industries or youth leaving and um, just trying to find ways that you acknowledge the struggles everyone's going through without trying to silence different voices because yours are only the, you know, it's it's so easy to just, you know, focus on your own situation. Yeah, it's cool to get your perspective too of like having that that family farm. I feel like yeah, it's it's cool that you're showing up because your perspective is really important. Like there's this is you guys are growing a lot of food. <laughs> and more importantly, a lot of beer. So <laughs> yeah, like there are, you know, I think potatoes and beer and beef. You're you're <laughs> so, so American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. It's a good thing I'm gardening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Well, and I think that, um, you know, it's I, I appreciate opportunities like this or, or ways to have a nuanced conversation because I, I find kind of coming to this fear, it's that imposter syndrome can be really strong. And then I can feel like, you know, I've only been in, you know, actively farming for a couple years or I'm... I'm the one that's, you know, doing the books and doing a few different things, but I'm not the one on the ground all the time, even though I'm trying to be more. I'm, you know, there's so many people that are doing this so much better or having, you know, these big, deep conversations or writing amazing grants. Mm -hmm. And it's, and then especially like coming from a rural area where it's so easy, you know, everyone or someone will hear this podcast and, you know, be like, that's not not how it actually is. Or, oh, this is not, this is not correct. Right. you know, I I want to I want to make sure that I'm uh, not misrepresenting the community or the people around me. But it's hard it's hard to be vulnerable, and I'm not I'm not awesome at that. But um, it's it's good to have opportunities like this where these topics are being approached with curiosity because mm-hmm. that's a good way to just start some of those conversations. Right. I think I think one of the reasons that I I love this podcast too is it's just stories. Like it's just the more stories, the better, like, and just getting different people's perspectives. Cause yeah, you're right. The nuance is like, that's the, that tends to be the end of every conversation. 
<laughs> to me. I'm like, we could talk all day, but it's nuance. It's there's no overarching sweeping answer to anything. It's all kind of in the margins and everybody's different situations. So it's really cool to see some a situation like yours. Like I think a lot of people would say, Oh gosh, if only I had, you know, land passed down to me, that would be just I would I would be so successful. And I just think it's there's so much nuance too to like there's a lot of family dynamics. There is a lot of like, what are you being given? How much responsibility are you taking? Raising a family and doing that, making sure your partner fits into that, making sure your personal finances are ready to run a farm. It's just, it's a lot too. I just think that, um, yeah, <laughs> I think the grass is always greener, but it's, it, you know, I really appreciate your story. I think it's really interesting to hear. Well, and hopefully that's something that, you know, finding those different ways that we balance the urban and rural and those connections and the, um, you know, bringing in social justice and mm -hmm. agricultural, you know, being able to do things yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we pass that on to our kids or how do we keep bringing those values into everything we do? I right. think that's important. Yeah. I mean, just yesterday, I was pretty proud of myself. We had, I had to change a tire and <laughs> I went to the farm and found a... Uh, you know, I've changed tires before, but yeah. I actually found the, the, you know, the four-way tire iron. It yeah. was so much easier. And I was just like, oh, I can do this. Hell can yeah. These out. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, God, that feels so good. That's just, yeah, stuff like that. I, I love that. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, telling your story, being brave and, and sharing your experience. Um, I really do value you and Kyler being in the community here in Colorado. So thank you so much for sharing your time. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it, Taylor. Thanks again to Emily for joining us. I really enjoyed our conversation. If you would like to keep up with Emily, you can follow her on Instagram at Emily A E B as a boy, or you can follow her on TikTok at farmer.e.brown. And you can also find more information about the organizations she's affiliated with, uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, and then she mentioned Annie's project in the description of today's episode. If you're looking for a way to get involved in regenerative agriculture, whether that is through a job, internship, educational event, or conference, you've come to the right place. Kibira Coalition has spent decades building a network within the regenerative agriculture community, and we love to share job, internship, and apprenticeship opportunities with our community through this podcast and our monthly newsletter. You can sign up for that newsletter at kiviracoalition.org slash get Dash e -news. Trainer Cattle Company is seeking a full-time ranch hand for their cow-calf and stalker operation located near Watkins, Colorado. They prefer someone with at least three years of experience but will consider less for the right motivated candidate. For the full posting, contact us or email the ranch directly under T-R-A-I-N-O-R ranch at yahoo.com. Birdwell Clark Ranch in Henrietta, Texas is hiring an assistant ranch manager. They're looking for a long-term employee who wants to adopt and further implement regenerative ranching practices. This position comes with housing and other benefits. For more information, go to holisticmanagement.org slash blog. Thank you for listening to Regeneration Rising, a podcast production of the Kavira Coalition. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and other popular podcast platforms. Become a Patreon supporter by visiting kaviracoalition.org slash podcasts. We'd like to thank Kavira staff for their contributions to this podcast. This episode was edited and engineered by Caleb Wenzel Fisher. Wanderlust, our theme music, was made by Scott Buckley. And we're grateful for our guests taking the time to talk with us about their experiences. Mm -hmm.